Hello, neighbor. It is very nice to see you here today. We have a very special visitor today. Okay, you know what? I don't, I don't like how that sounds. Uh, let me let me start that again. <laughs> Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 83 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm James, and we have a very special visitor coming to our neighborhood today. See what I did there? And here he is now, David Newell. Speedy delivery. Better, <laughs> <I> was... <laughs> better known to everybody, probably, as Mr. McFeely from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yes, for anybody who does not know, <laughs> David Newell is Mr. McFeely, the delivery man on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And in addition to playing the iconic part of Mr. McFeely, he has also worked in the public relations department for Fred Rogers Productions and has uh, uh, worked on projects uh, with them such as TV shows and tributes to Fred Rogers and also had a very memorable cameo in the film A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And what a beautiful day in the neighborhood it is to welcome you to Nostalgia Talk. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here uh, talking to you and making a, making yet another speedy delivery. <laughs> <laughs> so to start off, what did you aspire to want to become? Well, when I was, uh, let me see, I'm trying to think of the, when I was about eight years old, my grandfather took me to see my first play. It was a professional play, a touring company uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where I grew up in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And the name of the play was Harvey, starring a very famous comedian of the day, Joe E. Brown. He was very famous in movies back in the 30s. At any rate, it was about this. The play was a comedy about a person who thinks he sees a white rabbit, that a, a six foot tall rabbit whose name Whoa. was Harvey. And that's the only person who could see him was this one man. His name was Elwood in the play. And it was very funny. And I was entr entranced by the whole theater, by the lights and the curtains and the audience. And it really got me interested in theater. And that proceeded to uh, take me to the Pittsburgh Playhouse, which is, was a, a theater school. And I went there in the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, lo and behold, I ended up at Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Now, I skipped a lot of, lot of uh, detail, but that career and my interest in theater led me ultimately to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And uh, I thought, well, I have a job for one year when they hired me at the neighborhood. And here I am talking to you some 50 years later. <laughs> and uh, I spent my career in the neighborhood, so to speak. And I'm still doing events around the country next uh, well, a couple of weeks from now, I'm going to Florida for an event. Wow. And I was just in Michigan for uh, an event. Uh, so I'm still, uh, but I go as uh, David Newell, not in costume, but talk about, the my experiences with the program and sort of what you do nostalgia talking about uh, my years of the program and how much it meant to me and how much i learned from it and how much i thought the audience learned from watching mr rogers so that's a brief that's a brief uh, some summation of my uh, my career <laughs> mm. So acting was always something that you wanted to uh, pursue regardless. It was always an interest of yours. Yeah, it was always an interest, but I also had, and I think is is equally interested in uh, behind the scenes. I enjoyed the production end of it too. And I enjoyed being a stage manager and I, and I enjoyed uh, being uh, involved in the uh, creation of, of something. So it was my... Uh, my my I guess my aspiration was to be in some form of theater, which television is. Mm -hmm. So you said that you joined Mr. Rogers Neighborhood uh, from university is uh, when you started out. Uh, how did you first meet Fred Rogers? Um, I'm trying to think the first time. Well, the first time I, met, I knew who he was because he had a program in Pittsburgh before Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood called The Children's Corner. And it began, began in 1954 and ran for about seven years. Then someone at the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, 
brought him to Toronto to start Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So actually, the first showing of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood began in Canada mm-hmm. and, and Toronto on the CBC, and it covered all of Canada. And he, his sons were small at the time, and he wanted them to start school in the States. So he came back, and uh, what he did in Canada, he kept some of those uh, programs, and he combined new openings and closings in America and started a series called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood Here. Now, that ran for about six months, and somehow Sears and Roebuck Foundation saw them. And they thought, wouldn't it be great if he could do a series nationwide? And so they gave underwriting to begin the present Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And that's when I started. And I met Fred by a mutual friend. In -hmm. fact, I was in the summer of 1967. I was in London visiting my cousin who was there in the Navy. and And I got a telegram from the mutual friend saying that uh, uh, Fred Rogers has gotten some underwriting and the neighborhood is going to go national. And I've given Fred my name. He gave my name to Fred Rogers to interview me for a position on the staff. So I came back to Pittsburgh in maybe September of 67 and met Fred for the first time. I knew who he was and I had seen him on television, but I didn't, had never met him before. And uh, we talked for about an hour and he asked me about my trip. I told him I was in, visiting my cousin and I was taking a trip through Europe, et cetera. And uh, we talked and talked about everything for about an hour, except the job. <laughs> and, and that, that and, definitely goes and to show that Fred Rogers seemed very social. Yeah, it, it was just his way of interviewing me. So at the end of about an hour, he said, "Well, when can you start?" And that that was my interview. <laughs> so it wasn't. He didn't look at my resume. Well, he may have seen it earlier, but he he wasn't checking it out and saying, "Hey, when did you do this and when did you do that?" Told me, but none of that. He just, we just had a conversation and he relayed to me how he liked to travel and his favorite trip that he took and so forth. That was the interview and that was his style. He was, he was concerned about the person he was hiring, I think, to see if it would, if I think he, it was auditioning me in a way for the staff. I mean, it was more of a, not so much an audition, audition, I guess, but more of a compatibility. I guess that's the word. Mm-hmm. And I think we were very compatible over the years. And he was a wonderful person and a, 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 a perfect person to work for. Genuinely cared about the people who he worked with. He was a, it was the, he was the real thing. It wasn't a, that. It was the real thing. Mm-hmm. And it was just the highlight of my career, those years working in the neighborhood. Hmm. And so here did, I am talking to you. So, so did he like always want you to act on the show? Is that what he was interviewing you for? No, it, the interview was for a production uh, hmm. position. I was, I, I, I guess it was, well, the telegram I received said, Fred Rogers wants to hire a production person for the staff. And my friend knew I had that background too. And so I was hired initially to do the props, costumes, and just to be help him behind the scenes. And then, just as after he said, well, when can you start? He said, oh, by the way, I've also written in, he wrote his own scripts. I also have written in these new batch of scripts, a delivery person. And I want you to play that part. <laughs> and I said, sure. I'd love to do that. And, you know, a little bit of trivia, uh, the name of the character originally was called Mr. McCurdy. That was the name, not McFeely, it was McCurdy. Mm-hmm. And 
that was also the name of the Sears Roebuck Foundation's president. And, oh. and he was honoring them for giving him the underwriting money to do the program, to do those new weeks. And just as we were beginning to tape the very first program, it was about 20 minutes before we were going to tape the first program. The phone rang in the control room and it was Mr. McCurdy calling to wish us well and saying how much they liked the concept, et cetera. He said, however, please don't, don't call the delivery man, Mr. McCurdy. It may just seem a little too close, close since we're giving underwriting money. And so Fred said, okay, I'll uh, thank you for calling. And, he came back in the studio and he came right up to me and he said, we have to get you a new name. We're starting in 20 minutes. We have to find a new name for you. Before he finished that sentence, he said, McFeely, that's who you are because his middle name is Fred McFeely Rogers. That's a family name. So I'm Mr. McFeely and it's his mother's maiden name, McFeely. So the real uh -huh. Mr. McFeely was his his grandfather. Uh, oh, that's sweet. So that is a little bit of trivia for you. <laughs> so, but so from that point on, I was Mr. McFeely. <laughs> that's great. So, what are some of your favorite songs from Mr. Rogers? I mean, oh, you, you had yours, of course, the Speedy oh, Delivery yes, the, one. The Speedy Delivery song. I, uh, I, uh, I, that's a. He wrote that for me, and there's he wrote two delivery songs. The one's called. If there's anything you want, if there's anything you need, you know that one. Speedy Deliveries will bring it to you here with speed. And there's another one called That's What You'll Get. That's What You'll Get, a Speedy, Speedy Delivery. That's another one that sometimes, and I think, and I'm not a singer, but sometimes we, if we were running behind, he could tell the times. You know, if we had about three minutes to go, he would say, if I were in his his uh, television house making a delivery and he saw we had a little extra time, he'd always surprise me, just say, oh, Mr. McFeely, before you go, sing your speedy delivery song. And I never knew when he was going to do it. <laughs> and I wasn't always prepared, but thankfully our musicians were. They knew the song by heart so they could uh, accompany me. So... Uh, he, and he, he would stand by and smile because he knew <laughs> in a way that uh, I was getting through it, but uh, I'm not a singer, but he didn't care. He, it, was, it, was the, uh, it, it, it was the idea of, uh, of me having a, my own song and, and, and his idea of, of filling a, another minute before, the, <laughs> before we went to credits. So it was... Uh, I always enjoyed those moments, so uh, uh, they were spontaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't scripted, and that was what I enjoyed about uh, working on the neighborhood. Because the dialogue was written out, and maybe in the neighborhood of make believe, the dialogue you had to memorize the dialogue because that was with puppets. And had, but in the openings and closings, he would get the gist. He'd have a direction where he's one wanted to go, but sometimes he would ad lib through it and, and and change things as it was going along to keep it fresh. But basically there was always a structure to each program. It wasn't just turn on the cameras and let's visit. There was a, a structure to what he was uh, doing. But some of my favorite songs, uh, we had a guest on the program once whose name was Rita Moreno. That She's an, it's an actress from West Side Story. Mm -hmm. And she and has, for anybody who doesn't know, she can uh, she recently uh, got a lot of fame for the reboot of One Day at a Time. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And also she she uh, won an Academy Award for her performance in the original West Side Story, the film. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow, she came on the program as a guest and she sang uh, It's You I Like. That's a one of Fred's songs, a lovely rendition of it. Oh, and by the way, the the neighborhood can still be seen. It's on, if you get an app, there's a, an app called pbskids.org. Mm -hmm. And if you find, download that app and go into it, you can see about 400 Mr. Rogers neighborhood programs. And that's how people are still seeing 
Mr. Rogers. 400 on this app? Yeah. Whoa. Around three or 400. I know there's a lot. Uh, and you can get other uh, PBS children's programs, too, by getting the app. I, I, you've got to find pbskids.org. Mm-hmm. And if you go into it, you can, they have a, a line, of, there's a little photo all the way down, and you just click on Fred Rogers' photo, and you'll get into a series of uh of programs that you watch that and i think they're about 400 and there's another i think there's another one on our uh, our website the fred rogers productions website they have two weeks of programs up each time i believe mm-hmm. so uh, people can see it that way too so it's really still available a lot of people don't know that and there are also episodes available to watch on YouTube and uh, PBS uh, does. I, I see it on the TV guides here every now and again. Yes. too. And PBS uh, does. I think they do show broadcast. They show the neighbors still show it on the weekends. That's uh, right. At, yes. least, at least in the States. Uh, mm-hmm. And so people can see it. And I'm still getting letters from people who watch it and, People oh. like you who call, who you probably watched it when you were little, right? Did you? See I did. Right? Yes, I I watched a lot of PBS when I was a kid. I, I know none of the listeners can see it, but I'm I'm wearing my PBS T-shirt. Oh, I see. Wonderful. They'll love you for that. <laughs> yeah, the microphone is blocking the logo, but I'm <laughs> glad you showed that because PBS will love that. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a it's a wonderful system, you know. You can go to PBS no matter what type of programs you want, documentaries, children's programs. uh, They're all excellent uh, on on public television, and they have a lot of imports from England, some series that I watch PBS a a lot. Uh, That's my if I we had our cable company here in uh, where we live just changed uh, tiers and so forth. And I said, I don't care what I get. I just want to make sure whatever we have has PBS on it. I don't want to lose that. So that was mm-hmm. my one my one stipulation. I have to have PBS. So um, on the topic of uh, Mr. Rogers' songs, actually, uh, first uh-huh. of all, I would like to thank our mutual friend, Dennis Scott, for helping us connect. Thank you, Dennis, oh. if you are listening. Oh, good. Dennis is a big fan of the neighborhood. He's, mm-hmm. he's done a lot for the neighborhood, yes. Mm-hmm. And he lives in in nashville that's right yeah dennis was a previous guest on the show and we discussed <laughs> um we discussed his album thank you mr rogers which yes. um i'm uh i'm looking for it now it's i've i've uh, got it here on my phone it's it's totally <clears throat> worth listening to this album thank you mr rogers and what it is is it's songs from mr rogers neighborhood as sung by people like rita wilson mickey dolans vanessa williams tom bergeron kelly pickler um and you know they they do it really really well um were you involved in uh the making of this not at all uh, i i i um uh, i think he came to us first with this idea mm-hmm. and so he proceeded to do it because it's something you can do uh because I, I i think it's uh i don't know the the rights and music rights and so forth but if you mm-hmm. clear rights you can go ahead and make your own tribute album which it really is uh there's another album he made too but he made two of them that's right Dennis. yes and uh i'm blanking on the sec the title of the second one but uh songs from the neighborhood songs from the neighborhood why why i i should have remembered that but there are additional vocalists on that too every every song of mr rogers has a different singer that's on right. Both, yeah. On both albums. And it's there. If you like uh, Mr. Rogers music, it's and, and they're well produced and orchestrated and they all of the singers are top notch. Mm-hmm. And so I, if any of your viewers are looking for some music by Mr. Rogers, go to Dennis Scott. You can you can you can give out the the email or the source somehow, can you? <laughs> At some point. Well, if you if you guys want to uh, listen to uh, Dennis's Mr. Rogers albums, uh, the link to his website is uh, in the description of uh, the interview that I did with him. So you can check it out there. Oh. OK, mm-hmm. well, good. We mm-hmm. want we want to get uh, those songs out as far as we can. 
And then, mm-hmm. like, because a lot of people don't know that, and a lot of people don't know that the songs are available, those recordings are available. Mm-hmm. And every once in a while, I go to comic cons now and, and meet people. Mm-hmm. And every so often, someone will bring in one of the old LPs, long playing records that we put out in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of those songs, they were all by Mr. Rogers, though. He sung all those songs but they want me to sign my name on the the albums that they've had since they were a kid some of these albums are are uh, frayed around the the cover but they've kept them since they were the kid and i was recently in a i think it was in philly somewhere where the comic con and somebody brought several albums and that they had when they were little and kept them all these years and had me sign them so that's always that's a thrill sweet. because on the on the back of the the credits, my name is there. I help with some of the recording of the albums originally, way back when. So I get production assistant credit on the back of one of the albums or two of the albums. So uh, that's always a thrill to to meet people who really grew up with the program and have some of the some of the records and some of the books that they kept since they've been children and bring them in to have them signed. I'm going to be in another Comic-Con in a, no, not till October. I'll be in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. They're having a, a Comic-Con in Carlisle somewhere, but uh, your viewers will have to search it out somehow, but it's in Carlisle, and I'm sure they'll promote it around the time, mm-hmm. around November sometime. I think it's mid-November sometime. Mm-hmm. But I enjoy meeting the people who grew up with the program because most of the people who come up to my booth have grown up with the program. And there's a lot of people who, who did. Mm-hmm. And I, and I've been to several, and the last comic con before COVID wiped out a lot of comic cons, they had them all scheduled, mm-hmm. but the, one of the last ones I did, it was me as Mr. Not as Mr. McFeely, but David Newell, but also our friends from Sesame. And it was Carol Spinney, who plays Big Bird, and it was uh, Bob McGrath, and uh, I, I believe at that one was Emilio Delgado was at mm-hmm. that one too. Yeah. And that, that's I, 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 knew, I knew both Emilio and Bob before they passed away. They were wonderful people. Uh, wonderful people. Emilio and Bob were both wonderful. And, and so was Carol Spinney. And they all three have passed away within the last couple of years. Yeah. But that was such a memory for me to be with them, those couple. We did, we did about two years of comic puns together. And that was a wonderful experience. Uh, Talking about the music of Mr. Rogers, actually, uh, as you were saying that Fred used to surprise you with uh, wanting to hear the Speedy Delivery song, it kind of makes me wonder if a lot of the um, songs on that were performed live. Like, were were they ever actually, like, recorded and then they would be lip sync, or were they always performed live? Oh, they were performed live all the time. We had Johnny Costa, our pianist, and they had a a trio. Uh, It was bass and drums and piano. And each song that he did on the program was recorded live then. There was no going back. If there had been a glitch or something, they may have gone back and corrected a note or something, but it was always live. The openings were done live too, opening and closing, except here's the one thing that was pre-recorded. When the credit, when the opening of the neighborhood, you see the camera goes over the neighborhood, the panning to the neighborhood, you could hear the music underneath. Mm-hmm. But the live, that was pre recorded because mm-hmm. that wouldn't change. Each program, that would be the same. But the moment Mr. Rogers opened the door, the live music started when he would sing, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. That was all done live. Mm-hmm. And then the closing, was always live too because we never knew how much time we had for the credits sometimes if they had only they had to have a certain amount of time but if the we were tight that day johnny costa could speed up a little bit to get out right at 28 they, it came at 28 minutes something like that i forget the exact uh, time that the program actually was to to give to give them time to to put on 
color bars and all of that. Color bars being the color that you see that you don't see, the, the audience doesn't see, but the it's there to, for the engineers. Right. So Fred always wanted to do it live. He didn't want to pre-record. And he didn't think he was that good as a lip syncing. You know, that's that's tough, lip syncing. And he he wanted to be in the present and, and, and singing the songs live meant that he was, that's the closest he could be to being live for the children. And that was his goal, just to, to be a, a, com, a communicator. He wasn't a singer and he didn't see himself as a singer or even an actor. He saw himself as a communicator uh, and that's different. He, mm-hmm. he wasn't an actor at all. He, in fact, we used to do concerts with symphonies around the country. Uh, we did about four of them, the Pittsburgh Symphony and the Cleveland Symphony. We would do an hour. And these were for families with young children. And it would be the opening would be the first half hour would be me as the host, as Mr. McFeely in costume, and then Betty Aberlin, who played Lady Aberlin, and Francois Clemens, who played Officer Clemens. We would be the opening the first half hour and Betty and Francois would sing and I would welcome people. Johnny Costa would do a Mr. Rogers overture on the piano. And then about a half hour into that, we would introduce Fred and he would come out with a a small suitcase and we had a stool for him and he would sit on this stage on the stool and show the children the puppets. Now you wouldn't think it would work as well as it does on television, but it does. Fred always thought in this big theater, you know, some of these theaters were 3000 seat theaters and they were always filled, but it worked. When he brought Daniel Tiger out, you would hear a pin drop in the theater with all those children. They, it, it really worked because they were used to seeing him on television, but here, he would explain that uh, Daniel Tiger's a puppet. And he would bring him out and show him. And then he would sing a song related to Daniel. And, and it was very effective. And they were about an hour each. And we would always, they would always sell out. The tickets would go immediately. Wow. And they were too. But when he was doing that, he thought, I'm I'm acting. I'm not being Mr. My, Mr. Rose. He wasn't. He was being... To, to my way of thinking, he was being the same as he was on television, only in person. But he thought he was being more of an actor and not a communicator. Uh, and maybe there's a, there's, he had something, yeah, maybe he was right in a certain way. Because when you're on a stage and you're in front of people, you're sort of acting, but he's doing the same thing on television. You know, there are millions of people watching him there <laughs> on television, but mm-hmm. it was in a studio. And no, there was no audience. And yeah, so you never he, knew who was watching. He, no, you never knew. You never knew. It'd be, you'd be surprised that the letters we get from from all over the all over the, the country and Canada because it played in Canada too. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was one person who, or two people, who would go through the fan mail that came in and open it. Fred gave permission to open the fan mail. Uh, and a lot of it was, can you send me your pictures? And they were, you know, Fred would always sign every fan mail letter that went out. But there was a person there who would go through the mail. And if there was a question that may be somewhat difficult, that person would give their input to what how you could answer this. And, and Fred, that would help him because he'd be there all day answering fan mail. So that would help him get move with the letters along. But all the letters he would sign and he would edit them. And he sometimes he would write them all over again uh, in his way. But if it was just, could you send me your picture? He would sign it and say, thank you for, you know, and I hope you enjoy our, or television visit. He didn't call them television programs. He called them television visits. Oh, Anything that. to make it more personal. He he was trying to make television as personal as he could. Oh, 
And he always said the space between the television screen and the viewer at home, that was holy ground, that space. And producers of children's television, or any television for that matter, but especially children's television, have a responsibility to do the best they can, to do the, the best television program that they can for that young child. And Fred, Fred did that. You know, he, he had a, a degree in music. Mm -hmm. He had a degree in child development. And he had a, uh, he was a, uh, a, theolo a theological degree. He was uh, an ordained minister. And he never had a church. And I think he, I don't know why, actually, I can't answer that question. But I, I assume that he took the, uh, the theological degree to get, because it, it, it's had values and, and, and it really was a part of who he was. He was a very religious man, very devoted, but he never would use that on television, but he did use the, what he got out of all of those disciplines Mm -hmm. The, the uh, respect for his audience came from one of the disciplines. Respect for people, respect for childhood. Mm -hmm. And let's give children the best we can and help them. Because, again, these are young children. These are preschoolers. And he wanted to use television in the best way he can. And, and what got him into all of this, going back to another of your questions, was he was when he graduated from college with a music degree, he worked for NBC in New York City. Mm -hmm. He worked for some music shows that aren't on anymore. Back in the 50s, there's a very popular show called The Hit Parade. They did all the top 10 show of songs of the week that was on every Saturday night. It was live and he worked, he was the floor manager. And then he worked for a, a program called The Voice of Firestone, which was a sponsored by Firestone Tires, but it was all a classical music concert on television. Can you imagine that being on commercial television now? Anyway, <sighs> he worked for that, but he heard that, this was in late 53, 1953, that public television was beginning in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he said, I'm leaving NBC and the, his co-worker said you're crazy you're leaving nbc to go to work for a station that's not even on the air yet and he said yes that's what i want to do and the first program he did this was april 1st 1954 he brought on the children's corner which was his first children's programs and that eventually morphed into mr rogers neighborhood via canada and many other stops along the way mm -hmm. but uh that was his goal. He, he had a mission. I guess you could put it that way. And it, probably the theological de degree gave him that mission. And the, the music gave him a mission to, to uh, encourage children to love music because he loved music so much and instruments. And he played the piano by ear. Uh, he loved music. That was his favorite thing to do on the, on the program. Mm was to create the scripts and write the music. That was what he loved doing. Being on camera was not his favorite thing to do, but producing and writing the music was his favorite thing to do. And he did that well. That's sweet. Uh, as you were talking about uh, Fred showing uh, the, the uh, live audience uh, oh. at the live shows that Daniel Tiger was um, a puppet, uh, I heard a little story, and going back to the topic of Carol Spinney, I heard that when Carol came on as Big Bird, uh, Fred wanted to do a whole thing where he showed everybody how Carol works when he's inside of Big Bird, like having the monitor attached uh -huh. to him. And Carol had said no, because he wanted children to believe that Big Bird was real. Yes. N n yes. Not so much as real as he didn't want to break the the image of the character of Big Bird. You know, he didn't want to, I, I think children on some level knew that Big Bird was not real, but he did not want to break the illusion. 
of taking the head off. He, that's right. Fred did want to do that because he thought, well, there were two different two different approaches, and they were both correct. And I I respect what uh, Carol thought too that he didn't want to break the illusion of the, of Big Bird. And and Fred's was well, let's show that it's pretend, and show that how the costume works. More of a a curiosity how this costume works, and they were both valid. But Fred respected Carol's request, and and Carol appeared in the neighborhood of make believe as Big Bird, mm -hmm. and then uh, everything worked out fine. So and then. Fred was on Sesame Street and uh, with Big Bird, Bird. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, there was a there was a, an exchange of neighbors, so to speak. <laughs> but Carol yeah. Spinney was a wonderful person. Very, very warm and really cared about children, too. And he also did the voice of Oscar the Grouch, too. That's uh, right. Carol. And he loved doing both of this. And, and I, I was so fortunate to be able to spend time with him uh, in, at those comic cons. And his wife, Debbie, would travel with, with him. And he, she's a lovely person, a lovely person. And, and we had wonderful meals together. And I'll never forget those days. That's sweet. And, and another guest on Mr. Rogers that they kind of did the same thing for uh, showing that it was pretend was Margaret Hamilton with the Wicked Witch of the West. Yes, that's right. Uh, mm -hmm. That came to be because, let me see, uh, we had a letter from her once. No, there was a letter to the editor of the magazine in New York City that was the TV magazine for Channel 13 in New York City. Mm -hmm. And that was sent out to members of Channel 13 in New York and it had letters to the editor. And I happened to get a copy one day and it said, uh, my my children, my grandchildren love Sesame Street and and all the other children's program. And she said, but especially give Mr. Rogers a big hug for me. And that's what she <laughs> said in her letter. And I read that. I happened to get a copy of it. And I thought to Fred. So I said, Fred, do you think that we could invite Margaret Hamilton on the program? Because she really wanted to uh, tell children that it's pretend. It scared a lot of children, you know, the, the Wicked Witch in the movie. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to say that I'm an actress. And, and she felt bad because a lot of children were terrified by the flying monkeys and the, the witch. So Fred invited her on the program. And she came in in her civilian clothes, but she brought a costume that looked like the one she wore on the in the movie. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how is I'm I'm not a mean person. I'm not a wicked witch. I'm an actress, and I pretend that I'm playing this act this witch in the movie. And it helped. We had letters from parents afterwards saying thank you very much for help helping those. That explanation that Margaret Hamilton did to Mr. Rogers was very helpful. My children, it has helped my children watch the movie now it's, mm -hmm. that they know that it was just pretend. Well, ironically, she came on Sesame Street as well. I don't know if you saw this you know, or I, I, heard that story. Well, I knew that. Yeah. I, and they actually, I had heard that Sesame Street got letters from parents that said, that witch on Sesame Street is terrifying my kids. And, yes. but, but it wasn't done in a way that was like the witches pretend. It was done as an actual story about yes. the witch. Yes. And it's, that was probably not quite the right approach. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if you're writing, it's in theory, it's the right approach. But I think for the audience, they were too young to accept that scary witch, probably. Yeah, I remember but, watching The Wizard of Oz when I was a kid, and I was absolutely bloody terrified of that witch. Well, you see, well, that's exact. Well, that's well, good. That's good. well, not good that you were scared, but I'm glad <laughs> you mentioned that because uh, that's exactly why we did that segment, and mm -hmm. not only not only for that scary witch, but for scary images. It was really more of scary images to children that they mm -hmm. don't understand that that now there is. There are uh, there is a religion of witch witches and witchcraft and which that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about scary <laughs> images in, in movies, mm -hmm. and uh, and we also did one of the Incredible Hulk, mm -hmm. uh, 
we went to the set of The Incredible Hulk because my daughter, when she was three years old, she's now in her late and early 40s, uh, was terrified by The Incredible Hulk. She watched it by chance one evening, turned on the TV, and there it was. And so we did a segment by going to Universal Studios, showing Lou Ferrigno, the actor who played the Hulk, mm -hmm. getting into his green makeup and the fright wig, and they put green contacts in his eyes. But he started with Lou as the actor, and they did the process of showing how the wig fit on, how the green makeup went on, how the he had a, a, a nose that was uh, applied. And that helped children to see that it was pretend. What Fred did was separating pretend from reality. He wanted to let children know that that's pretend. He always, that's why he came into the neighborhood of, that's why he came in, put on his sweater. He was in a way getting into play clothes, symbolically mm -hmm. into play clothes and meeting children on their own level. And then he would separate that by going to the neighborhood of make-believe, that's pretend, but always ending the program by bringing the children back to reality. So he separated fantasy and reality. And children needed that, that age. Now, I now a 12-year-old understands that, but sometimes a, a preschooler doesn't separate the two. So I think that was very helpful to do it that way, to, to break it down and have Margaret Hamilton come as herself, the actress, and then explain the costume and show the costume. Mm -hmm. And that, and like, there were a lot of other great guests on uh, Mr. Rogers. Uh, you mentioned Lou Ferrigno. Uh, one of the episodes that I re rewatched, I haven't watched Mr. Rogers in a while, but one of the episodes that I watched to get ready for this and to research for it was where Fred went to Eric Carl's studio to show how his books were made. Oh, yes. You, yeah. you saw that one. I did, yeah. yeah. He, that was a location uh, uh, segment. We went to, uh, I think he lives somewhere in New England, uh, and he has this beautiful studio in uh, some, uh, I'm blanking on, on the actual place in New England where his studio was, but it was he, it was a wonderful segment. Well, you saw it, right? And he showed how he, he mixed the colors, mm -hmm. and that when you think about it that segment has a lot in it that's not obvious right away first of all there's the friendship of the two men you know the fred and and each one respecting each other's career mm -hmm. then there is creativity uh, of taking colors and any way you want there's no pattern or there's no rules for being creative you know it's the inspiration that the person might have. And here are some colors showing these to children. And you too can make a design, maybe not like that one or like that one, but use your own imagination and use the colors you want on this piece of paper. And that was a lesson within that little segment too. And then just being identifying colors, reds and blues for that age group, there was so much packed in that 15 minute segment that you don't see it. But if you mm -hmm. watch it several times, you can analyze it. And that was all Fred's doing. He would think that's what he wanted that segment to be is creativity and, and, and friendship and exposing children to art and exposing children to, to create art and, uh, and, and, and in some ways, you don't have to be on your iPhone or your iPad or watching television. <laughs> there are other ways of, of using your creativity, and painting is one of those. Creating, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to mean anything. The colors can just be all mixed. There's no, there is no right or wrong way to be creative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think all of that was in that little segment. And, mm -hmm. and that takes a lot of forethought to do that. You know, those those segments were planned in Fred's head and, and sketched out on a piece of paper. But it is really at the moment that all of that came. It was almost improv improvisational. He was just telling Fred how he creates 
mm-hmm. Eric Carle. Yes, it was one of my favorite, my favorite uh, episodes. I, I loved it. Uh-huh. Were there any other celebrities who came on that show that uh, have uh, been been favorites of yours in your memory? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you know the singer whose name is Tony Bennett. Do you know that name? I do. Yeah, he just passed away a couple of months ago. Yes, he was a wonderful man, and uh, he came to Pittsburgh for a concert. Just and I think at the time his daughter. This was going back a while. His daughter, who's now an adult, watched the program and wanted her dad to be on Mister Rogers. So I guess the agent, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> and the agent of of. Tony Bennett called our one of our producers and said Tony Bennett's going to be in. He'd love to be on the program, uh, and he's also an artist. So what he did, he didn't have much time to learn lines, but uh, we did a segment with Lady Elaine. Fred did the the voice of Lady Elaine. Fred wasn't he was behind the scenes and he did the puppet, but Tony Bennett is an artist and he drew a sketch of Lady Elaine in, in time is the viewer was watching it. Wow. And and he did it once for rehearsal and once for a take. He did it one take and he did this. And I have the sketch framed. Uh, I, I, I kept it and he signed it. Benedetto, Benedetto. That's his, his, uh, he, what he signed on his sketches. But he, he, that was a memorable time because he's such a nice man. And then that evening, uh, we went to see his performance. He was he did a concert at one of the, the theaters in Pittsburgh. That that's why he was in Pittsburgh to do that concert. That was a favorite. Oh, there were so many uh, wonderful guests we had on the program over the years. I'm trying to. There's just so many. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of some others and there were some that uh, you would know but there was a a man who made buckets wooden buckets mm-hmm. uh, they call the, that uh, a cooper that's the name of people who make wooden buckets and he was there that was a location uh segment two and he was who he was he there he he it was he was sort of just not, not not overly sophisticated just a a man who loved making wooden buckets and been doing it his all his life and you got the feel of a real person uh-huh. doing what he loves to do and oh another one here's do i have time to t- i'll tell you another one by all means yeah of course there was uh when fred was studying child development for the university of pittsburgh he was assigned to go to a, a daycare center that was part of the University of Pittsburgh and observed children at play. You can learn a lot by observing children, just how they interact with each other. You don't have to interact with them. You just observe them. So the one day, well, the, the, the tradition of this school was that each week a parent would come in and show the children what that parent does for a living, like a baker or a a uh, jeweler or something like that. Well, this one day, a parent came in and he was a sculptor and he brought in a big chunk of clay. That's all he did, didn't say anything. The children were sitting all around the table and he plunked down this clay, didn't say anything, but started to make a sculpture, a, a simple sculpture, like a horse or something. And, uh, didn't tell the children and the children observed this and they saw how much he loved what he was doing and there's a saying i think it's a quaker saying if you love if if you do what you love in front of children they'll catch your love in other words attitudes are not taught they're caught, if that makes sense. And I think that's a Mormon saying. I'm not quite sure, but it uh, could be Mormon or one of the uh, uh, religions like that. Mm-hmm. But that was a wonderful segment because afterwards, after that parent came there and did that, that horse that he loved doing so much, the children caught his enthusiasm for the rest of the semester. 
their artwork was so much better than they had been doing up to that point, if that makes sense to you. I, I, you know, I'm, did, did, did I explain that clearly enough? But yeah, they, point they, was, yeah, absolutely. The, my point was that they caught his love for his, his work, his being a sculptor. They caught that and they were able to then do their own. And in a way, take that love that he gave them and they observed and put it into their own works of art. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Now they weren't, they weren't all Michelangelo's by any means, (laughs) (laughs) but you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Uh, Talking about um, celebrities and um, kids watching people do what it is that they do. uh, I was wondering if you had any, any interaction with Ernie Coombs or if that was somebody that Fred ever talked about at all. Oh oh, yes. I, I, and and just for any of the listeners who don't know who Ernie Coombs is, um, some people refer to him as like the Canadian Mr. Rogers. He was uh-huh. known. He he was uh, to a lot of us. He was Mr. Dress Up. And um, yes. there's a documentary on Amazon Prime now. I saw it at the Atlantic Film Festival here in Halifax. It's called uh, Mr. Dress Up: The Story of Make Believe. It's actually worth watching. It's really really well done. No, I, I've seen it, and Mr. Rogers was interviewed for it too, I believe. Wasn't there a segment of Mr. Rogers in it? Yeah, there was. Uh, there were a couple of uh, uh, segments with Fred in it. And well, you know, yes, I met Ernie Coombs uh, several times. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first time I met him, he was just visiting Pittsburgh, visiting Fred. But you know, he's from Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. Ernie Coombs. And how it started is that on the children's corner. Uh, he, Ernie Coombs, helped Fred. Mm -hmm. And he designed one of the puppets, and I think Fred told me it was Lady Elaine that Ernie Coombs actually designed. But then, when Fred was called to go to the CBC, Ernie went with him as his assistant. And they did about two years of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and Ernie was helping with that. Not quite two years, but he was there for almost two years. And when Fred decided to come back to Pittsburgh, he said to the CBC, why don't you find a program for Ernie? And I think it started out, I think the first one was Peppermint Place or something like that. There was one before Mr. Dress Up. I'm not quite sure, but I think there was one leading up to Mr. Dress Up. But then Mr. Dress Up came along and he became, you're right the Mr. Rogers of Canada. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but Ernie was, Ernie really was similar to Fred, had the same pace and was very deliberate and, and obviously loved what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and, he and Fred were, were, were so alike in many, many different ways. Uh, I think, I think Ernie, was more of a performer than Fred was, but he was close to being who he was, but he would, he at times would do, I think other little characters on the show too. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Did he and, and Mr. Dress Up? Yeah, he uh, would have. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because, yeah, and I haven't seen that many, but I have seen the show, but I've met Ernie a couple times, a very nice man mm-hmm. and well-deserved uh, that documentary. I saw the documentary and that's well deserved. There's a documentary on Fred called. Uh, it's uh, I think it's Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. I get them mixed up. Is that is that uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Yes, Won't You Be My Neighbor. That yes. was really well done. Yes, that was a theatrical uh, uh, film. It played theaters first. It yeah. wasn't done for television. It, it did uh, uh, played. It, it played through in, in in Europe too. It went to Europe. Now, the neighborhood is not as well known in New York, but it's becoming so because people, I think, now are able to get things on streaming and the neighborhood. And a lot of people have copies now of they've made of the neighborhood. And when they move maybe to Europe or something, they think so. It has a little following, but its main following is in the States. It's uh, in North America. Yeah. Yes. But uh, what was the other thing I was going to add to that? Uh, and I blanked on it, but it had something to do with uh, with Ernie and the the. Well, it may come to me. I can't remember. But I just want to say how much uh, 
I respected both of them, Fred mm-hmm. and Ernie, for what they did for children's television. They they are uh, they are pioneers. They mm-hmm. really are, and they yeah. they they came at a time when television for children was slapstick, uh, old movies. And there's nothing wrong with slapstick. It's just that we can do better. Fred said he was home for Easter break from college and was watching television. Now, this was in the 50s. Mm-hmm. And he would turn television on for children and see a lot of slapstick comedies being remounted to show kids because they're funny. But he said, you know, he had nothing against the slapstick comedies. Well, the big, problem, said, with sl- the big problem with slapstick is that it's easy to imitate. Uh, yes. Which can be a little bit of an issue when you're a, a child. Yes, you can. That that's an issue. But he said we can do better than that. Let's take, let's go deeper than that. You know, children can take more than slapstick. They can understand nuances more than you think they can. But it has to be appropriate for the age. That's one thing about Mister Rogers' Neighborhood, that it was age appropriate. It was geared to that narrow audience between two and uh, maybe early elementary that's it was his age range and fred would deal with topics dealing with that age range people who are for instance a lot of children when they get out of uh, kindergarten face going to school or out of uh, daycare face to going to school for the first time you know going to school the some don't even go to to uh, daycare. They go right into kindergarten or right into school, and that's a that's a big move. You might not think of it as we don't we forgot them maybe, but children at the time are are very apprehensive. What's going to happen? What are we going to do there? Will I be able to go to the bathroom there? Well, they don't know this. They're thinking about the very practical things that concern them, and Fred made a. Uh, uh, a program about it, showing showing how you have your snacks at, uh, and, but then he showed uh, where the bathrooms are. He did one for kindergarten and he did one for first grade, showing that here's the bathroom and here's when you take your lunch break and your teachers he had a he had a teacher show them the children in the classroom. So he took things and tried to demystify anything that might be scary or apprehensive for young children in his programs. Again, it's for young children. A 12-year-old would realize... A 12-year-old that... would be totally used to it because they've like, yeah. been, been through it all these years. I mean, when I when I was 11, the elementary school that I uh, went to, uh, actually, when I was 10, it had been torn down and uh, they yeah. were rebuilding a new one on the same site. And so we went to a different elementary school and a lot of our events were actually shared with that uh-huh. elementary school and a lot uh-huh. of us became very good friends and then the new one come and then the new one comes in uh they finally finished it i only ever went there for one year but because of the extra room they also expanded and brought students from the elementary school near where i currently live which is just down the road and and you were talking about uh, how kids were apprehensive going into school for the first time we uh-huh. actually had an assignment where we would write letters to these soon to be new students telling them what Waverly Memorial, which is the elementary school I went to, what that was like, uh, who a lot of the teachers were and what they were like, and kind of like what we were going to, what what they could expect from that. Well, that's exactly what Fred was doing through television in a way. That was a, whoever thought of that at your school, that was a wonderful idea because I don't, I've never heard of that. But I'm sure a lot of schools do that, but that's the first time I've heard that approach and i think that's a wonderful idea Mm -hmm. because it is scary even you know when you go to high school for the first time i don't know if they have the high schools the same in canada as it is in the states but you're you go as a freshman and that's yep you're i guess what you're i can't remember the first year yeah yeah and and that's because you're meeting a whole new uh group of 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 children or your peers at that point Mm. And that's a little scary going to high school for the first time. So that idea going to, going to high school is scary for the first time. What about going to college too? Yes, that that that's true. But that maybe it gets. Yeah, I don't think it gets any easier. I going to college with you're that's a 
you're away from home then, and it's mm. a whole new adjustment. So those years, I think some of the toughest years are the teen years, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and yeah, screw growing up. And, and I think, you know, we, we've got a lot of letters from, from teenagers who watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And I think my theory is, and I don't know how sound it is, but I think they think back to the time they were watching Mr. Rogers when they were five, four, five, six, and how comfortable they were. And it's helpful to watch Mr. Rogers again when you're going through into high school or college and watching Mr. Rogers again, and maybe it would help you with some of your comfort level. I don't know. That's just my theory that, uh, and, because, and that's, one, and that's one of the things with bullies too. I mean, like they, um, tend to be very, uh, unkind a lot of the time, but what did Mr. Rogers always teach us? Be kind. And yes. like, that, and, and as you were saying, you know, they can go back and rewatch it. It's not that hard for them too. No, it, it's not. But you know, the bullies, uh, that's a whole nother psychological thing. Cause they, they, oh, they, yeah. They they they're probably a, a a product of being bullied too. Exactly. At some yeah. point. I mean, that's a whole that you need a, a psychologist, psychiatrist to have that be. I can't begin to describe that phenomenon, but but it, it is a problem. It's a yeah. problem in schools these days. I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but bullies are they're somewhat scared. I think, and they they. Uh, they're frightened too in their own way and they take it out on others and it, it's, it, it needs to be addressed. And I don't know. And I think you don't, it's, it's hard to address it when the bully is in their teens. It's yeah. starting out when they're in their preschool years, that's when you're, you're forming your, your, your life. And, and that's why preschool education is so necessary. Mm -hmm. And not only education, as far as, education uh math and so forth but but uh emotional education is what's yeah. important at that age mm -hmm. um, and that's what mr rogers does through television the best he can you know television is not going to cure the world's ills the one program but why not do it and mm -hmm. he did a terrific job both he and ernie did a wonderful job of emotional education through television mm -hmm. And I'm glad I was a part of one of them, <laughs> the neighborhood. <laughs> well, talking about um, uh, Fred, uh, in two if you don't feel comfortable uh, answering this question, it's not something that you have to answer. Don't feel obligated to. Uh, but I was kind of wondering how it felt for you. And if it's too hard for you to talk about it, you don't have to. But how did it feel for you in 2003 when Fred died? You know, we had some preparation for it okay but i'm still i'm still i still miss him every day you know i yeah. miss the interaction but here's what happened here was the preparation he okay. was he was the grand marshal of the rose bowl parade along with bill cosby and art linkletter the year of 2003, but Fred was not feeling well. And he called me one day. I had, he said, did you get the tickets for the, uh, the flight to California in our return flight? Cause he was going back. He was going to go to Florida on the way back to meet his wife and spend some time in Florida. And he said, well, I need to change those. I think I want to come back to Pittsburgh. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, I have to have a little operation. And that's what he described, a little operation. And he did. We came back. We did the Rose Bowl. He, was, he ended up, it was stomach cancer. And he knew he, I think he had an idea of, of the seriousness of the, but I don't know if he knew how serious as it was. So we went, we did the Rose Bowl. He was in a lot of discomfort. And he did the tossing of the coin for the Rose Bowl game. And then the next day we got him on a plane and back to Pittsburgh. And, oh, but the next 10 days he went into the hospital for his operation. And it was stomach cancer. And he was home for about maybe a week or two. And then it just, they didn't get it all. And it, the, 
it he he died uh i think it's february 27th oh wow uh, this past this past tuesday it's been yes, 21 years then 21 years yes that was wow. the anniversary of his passing and and to this day i still i look back at all the good times we had and he was not only an employer and and in quotes a boss fred would never say he was anybody's boss but just to make it clear he was my employer and and, and but we were friends too and our families my wife and his wife and when the children were younger would have dinners together and he he became a a, a family friend Mm-hmm. And it, it uh, and it was, and I reflect back all the time uh, on events that we did, and the, the, some of the good times we had, and, and on different trips, and how we would turn something in that was a chore. You know, when you go out and you do a concert, it's really tough. It was mm-hmm. tough on him, the travel, the rehearsal, the performance, all of that. But we would have after the concert was over we would have a dinner usually and it, they were so it was so much relief i think for him that the concert was over he didn't have to perform <laughs> yeah fair we'd have a good time and i remember those times and we'd laugh and, and talk about different and it and i i i i miss those times and i miss what i really miss is the taping of the program going in and making the program and and not seeing the people we work with every day and some of the cast members and some of those some of the cast members have passed away and so it's been it's it's uh i guess you would call it bittersweet mm-hmm. you know when i think back on it it's very it's bitter it bitter, it bittersweet's a, a good description for it mm-hmm. but i would not trade it for anything those years that I had working, it was over 35 years producing, and then I'm still associated with the, the program and the company in, in, in a freelance way. Those years, and continuing those years, have been just wonderful, wonderful years for me. I'll, I, I consider myself fortunate. In fact, I'm trying to put a book together <laughs> of my oh, wow. years. And it's not easy. I think everybody who interviews me, I keep telling them I'm trying to put a, a book together and um, I'm going to do it. I'm determined to do it somehow, put down the thoughts and maybe some poignant stories and maybe some stories about Fred, but it's not going to be a biography of Fred Rogers. It will be. It'll just be uh, like a memoir of your experiences working with him. That's it. Exactly. That's great. Yeah, exactly. Well, 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 let me know when it comes out and I'll promote the hell out of it for oh, you. Okay. Well, it's going to be a while yet, but uh, I, I, I've got a few chapters done and I keep thinking Ooh. of ways to, you know, what do I want to do next? But I have to sit down, you know, you know how hard it is to, to write. Oh, so even, trust, trust me. Even, I do. Even professional writers have a hard time sitting down. You know, I have the cleanest house <laughs> since I want to write a book, you know, in other words, oh, before I sit down to write the book, I'm going to clean my office. You know, you're just <laughs> fooling yourself. Oh, now I better sharpen all the pencils. That's what I'll do next. Oh, but I'll get now before I start, I better get my lunch because I might get hungry. To, you know, anything to delay it. You you're trying to fool yourself and you shouldn't do that. Yeah. So For, I've got procrastination. Word procrastination and there's a there is a, a a course in procrastination you can take to not procrastinate so i've got but i think everybody has a a part of procrastination in them now my wife was a wonderful student she loved uh school i wasn't a big fan of school but she would do her homework on Friday nights, and that's the kind of, and I would do my homework at the last minute on Sunday night. <laughs> that's the difference. I was, I was the kind of guy who, in high school, if all my stuff was done and I gave it to my teacher, I of course I'd ask my teacher anything you want me to do. And if they said no, I'm like, okay, well, I have this project for my next class that's due right away, and it's not finished yet. This gives me time to finish it then. Well, well, so you were you liked school, didn't you? 
I, I have very fond memories of the high school that I went to, even though sometimes they were, it was not easy. But I think the thing that I remember most is the friendships and a lot of those yeah. people I am still friends with. But also you, not only the friendship, but you like the, the learning too. You like learning new things. You were curious too. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you liked, uh, you liked the education part of it too. Mm -hmm. High school, as we said earlier, is not easy. I don't know if anybody who just breezes through it. Well, mm -hmm. there probably are some, mm -hmm. but uh, it's tough. It's a mm -hmm. tough time. It's uh, yeah. And that's what I, I hope that some people who might be viewing this uh, realize if anybody's having a tough time in high school, it's, it's, you're, you're not, not alone. You're not alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was just talking to one of my friends about that today. Yeah. And you're not alone. And, and I think that just knowing that may help someone. Mm -hmm. That you're not alone. Other people are struggling too with maybe the education or maybe not getting their, maybe not learning algebra very well, or on the other side, not uh, having trouble socially, you know, dealing with their classmates or being shy or being bullied. Mm -hmm. That all happens. Yeah. And uh, it's sad, but in a way, it's a, uh, I guess you can say it toughens you up for life. Yeah. <laughs> Your life's not going to be that easy, but you can try to make it as easy as you can. But I think one of the lessons that can help anybody as they're going through life is kindness. Just think of that other person, you know, just think what they may be going through and, and try to, to help in some ways just being kind and just listening to somebody else telling what may be bother them is being kind, just listening and giving them a, a shoulder to, to lean on, to, yeah. to talk to that's, that's, that's being kind. So uh, in fact, the, the week uh, I'm going to Florida in a month and they're having a week of kindness It's called kindness week. And it takes place on the campus of, uh, Rollins College, where Fred went to school. In, oh, uh, wow. And so we'll be having some seminars and uh, talking about how Fred used television to uh, teach children about kindness and thoughtfulness. Yeah, I, I saw something on uh, Instagram that was a drawing of Fred Rogers, Jim Henson, Bob Ross, and Steve Irwin. And it said, the four icons of our childhood, and they all taught us to be to be nice in whatever way that was. I mean, yes. like Steve Irwin, be nice to animals. Bob Ross, uh, be nice to nature. Because you know, yeah. if you if he painted yeah. it. Jim, Jim Henson, just be uh, spontaneous and be nice. Being spontaneous, Fred Rogers, be nice. Period. That's right. Well, it, they they all have their own way of doing that too. That's what's so so uh, wonderful about life in itself you know they all were dealing with that age group mm -hmm. but they all had their special way of telling their audience how to be respectful of others to be kind to others and at the same time encouraging creativity in their audience mm -hmm. and they were all doing the they all were they all had a mission they really do when you start to think of it and that mission is television that's the vehicle. Television is the vehicle that, that was able to reach people. And that's why Frank got into television. He thought, well, you know, I want to be able to help on some level children. And television was coming into its own in the 50s. And that's, and that's the way to reach a lot of children. There was this mission to, to, to create a program that would be helpful to that age group. And that's what he did. And that was the Children's Corner, which eventually turned into Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, which is now available online on yeah. the new way of viewing things. It became broadcast television and now it's on streaming. Live. Yeah. Yeah. Streaming. So, but what he produced is still viable today. It still applies to the audience of today with his programs. Now, some of the costumes may look dated or the ties may be too wide or something but but the content is still is still valid yeah clothes, cl clothes don't make the man the person makes no. the man no that's right that's right 
And that that is what the program does to this day. And I hope your viewers find that app, the PBS Kids dot org app and and uh, watch more of the programs they're they're they're, they're out there yep. and if they uh, if they ever want to get uh, a, a picture of me as mr mcfeely they can email me and i can give you my email address should i do that do, do you want to uh mention your email address i can i can i can do it okay it's go simply, ahead it's simply d newell n-e-w-e-l-l one nine five six at gmail.com well there you and, go if, if you want a picture from uh, david newell there there's uh or, how you, there's how you can get it and and or just send the message i'd love to hear i get i i get a lot of emails saying how much uh, they love the program in fact i had one uh, i had it here i'm i'm sitting here at my desk answering uh emails and sending out uh, pictures i just got one well i got one from germany whoa from germany saying could you please send me three cards meaning photos mm -hmm. and i i've gotten i've gotten some from uh, a lot from germany i i think somehow there must be some satellite or something that has pb i don't know how they get get it in germany but maybe somebody has taken I don't know. Anyhow, or it could it could be from streaming or YouTube. Yeah, or... it could be. It could be. Yes, because today you know things get around with all this the current uh, magic. I call it all. You know, the streaming is magic to me. All of a sudden, there's a, a program you you want to see that is in somewhere in your computer. Years right. ago, when I was growing up, you, you had to wait for it on television. If your program came on at five o'clock, you had to wait and be there at five o'clock, or you'd miss it. And, and you I can no just chance. put things. And I can just watch things with the click of a button. Yes, and now you can see the. If you miss a program at five, you can watch it at three in the morning if you like by by streaming. So it's it's remarkable, and there's so much available out there for kids that that I uh, then I and I hope the parents, uh, and I think they probably do. Uh, watch what kids are watching on their i'm not talking about teenage i'm well even that but i i'm talking about kids getting into an ipad or a computer that's not uh they can monitor there's some way you can make it kid friendly right not being able to get into other things on the computer uh i worry about that and i worry about kids playing on computers and getting into a lot of stuff that Maybe they aren't. Yeah, not like very, very naughty stuff. Yes, there's a lot yeah. of that out online these days. Oh yeah, and and that's possible. Whereas, mm -hmm. whereas just on television, it was a little more containable. Oh yeah, and anyway. and and, 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 it, and more often than not, it still is. Yes, I guess yeah. you're right. But uh, I hope that I would encourage parents just to just to monitor what their kids are maybe watching. I think they have a right to do that. Uh, it's 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 helpful i think mm -hmm. that's just my opinion maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm right i don't know no, I, I i i agree i absolutely well, agree well good i'm yeah. glad uh at any rate it's been a wonderful wonderful uh time and i'm still delivering in the neighborhood i haven't retired i'm just uh <laughs> in a a, a a different mode of delivering now mm -hmm. but uh i i love to hear from people and what the program meant to them mm -hmm. uh, and i get a lot of that unsolicited they find my uh email somehow mm -hmm. maybe through a station or something i don't know well, well, talking about um, people uh, loving Mister Rogers' Neighborhood, uh, uh -huh. there are there are a lot of spinoff shows uh, these days. Uh -huh. uh, Daniel, so it definitely goes to show that the legacy of Fred Rogers and Mister Rogers' Neighborhood is still popular among the age group these days. Uh, you know, we've got Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Don Quixote, both of which are airing on PBS. I know a lot of people uh -huh. who are puppeteers on Don Quixote. Um, uh -huh. And of course, we've got the Tom Hanks film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, which, of course, you made a little cameo, a cameo in. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, a lot of these new uh, a lot of these new projects? Well, I, 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 I especially love Daniel Tiger because that's probably the closest to Fred's 
philosophy. The it really Tyke. is. Yeah, I watched yeah. a little bit of it myself too. And and Daniel, in a way, has become the Fred character, the Fred person, because he Daniel puts on a sweater and puts on his sneakers uh, at the beginning of each program, yeah. and the trolley connects. Is the trolley is still there? And the messages are similar, but it's animated. And there's a there's an animated McFeely in it too, I believe. Yep. And I, I like Daniel Tiger because that is the closest to Fred and Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Don Quixote is wonderful. It it has the same mission of uh, good children's television, but it has uh, a little more, it's more concentrated to purple pandas in that mm-hmm. and uh, a don quixote and if your viewers have never seen these two they're on most public television stations around the country yep. so they should should catch them and they're daniels is uh geared for the preschool as is don quixote don quixote may go a little older but it's it's a wonderful show too. And that's based on a puppet from Mr. Rogers neighborhood, Don Quixote. That's right. And that's a play. I don't know if people get it's spelled donkey. Don Quixote. Yeah. Yeah. Don Quixote. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know if you know who Gordon Lightfoot is. Yeah, I do. The Canadian folk singer. He released yeah. an album called Don Quixote and it's one of, it's an album. I grew up in the pop and rock generation. Like I like Backstreet Boys, all time low, Britney Spears, uh, simple plan, uh-huh. Jonas brothers. And, um, but my grandfather and my dad introduced me to Gordon Lightfoot. And at my grandfather's cottage, we used to listen on our phones to Gordon Lightfoot's Don Quixote album. <laughs> but that's spelled the, the regular way, Don Quixote, right? That's right. Yeah. Q U, however they spell it. I X O T E. But this is a I play on with you. You're welcome. <laughs> this is a play on words. Right. Uh, in yeah. case people haven't heard. And sometimes people don't get it right away. They, they'll say, well, there's a program called uh, Don Quixote. And then, oh, oh, oh that takes them away. The, the, then they, uh, children don't know. The children <laughs> don't, get, don't get the play on words. But that was also Fred's, uh, he loved play on words, like the Don Quixote. He loved to, to make sort of, they're not nonsense words, but he loved to play with language. And he loved language. He spoke uh, French, and he oh, wow. uh, and he also uh, spoke Hebrew. He knew that was through his religious studies, and uh, he was familiar with uh, several languages, but could speak fluent French. Uh, and that's why the puppet Grand Père was on the program. I don't know if you he wasn't on the neighborhood that often, but he began on the children's corner, and he began as a as introducing children to another language, French. And Fred would use Grand Pair to teach French on the children's corner. Not not a, a half hour lesson, but dropping a few French words. So just to let children know there are other languages, there are other people, there's a whole world out there. All of that was part of Fred's mission. Mm-hmm. We, you know, other people speak other languages and we should learn to appreciate it was a lesson to appreciate others and be kind to others i'm i'm simplifying the the mission but i think yeah. you get the idea yeah so to, to wrap it up talking about the uh, film beautiful day in the neighborhood uh um, uh-huh. what was it like to uh did you actually me- I, i'm gonna be <laughs> totally honest i didn't see it in the theater i wanted to but i had so many things to do for a long time i was in college we were doing student film projects. I had things that I had to be doing for a lot of those. I was starting to direct one finally, and uh, I went to film school. And um, so, so yeah, I was just way too busy. It was on my radar, but I just got so tied up. Uh, so this <laughs> actually stupid question. You confirmed you were in that film. Uh, I was about to, I was going to ask, were you actually in it? Because yeah. I had a guest, uh, Laura Faye Smith, who, uh, she came on the show and she was credited for it on IMDb. And she's like, IMDb uh, miscredited me. <laughs> oh, it, uh, no, who was it? Who, Laura? Laura Faye Smith. She's a voice actress. Oh, okay. Yes, I had a, well, I was there when they were filming. They they filmed in, in Pittsburgh and uh, New York City. They may have gone to Canada too. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Uh, for some scenes. 
for New York scenes, I'm not sure. But I know that they filmed, they were in Pittsburgh a good while, and uh, they filmed in the studio where we made Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So you so you were like there watching Tom Hanks work? Yeah. Uh-huh. Cool. I was. <laughs> and uh, yeah, in fact, there's a scene in the movie, and it was done at a restaurant downtown Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And we were, and the producer wanted us to wanted us to be in the film as the cameos, the people who work with Fred. So we were there were about six of us sit, sit, seated at a table near where Tom Hanks and Matthew Reese were having a conversation. Mm-hmm. And the and Tom Hanks, as Fred said to Matthew Reese, think of the people who helped you as you were growing up. And that was, and then they thought, and the camera panned around the restaurant and you could see it go past our table and you can see me sitting there and you can see, uh, there, Margie Whitmer, who was our producer, was was in in the scene. As was uh, Mrs. Rogers, Fred Rogers' wife, was in the scene too. Mm-hmm. And then the camera went on and back to the table with Tom Hanks and Matthew Reese. And they did that. It took us all morning to do that one little one little scene of camera panning, and they would change angles and they would do close ups and things like that. But yes, I was. But you have to look closely it's not a speaking role but there is in a scene with tom hanks there's someone who plays mr mcfeely there's an actor who plays mr mcfeely (laughs) and he makes a delivery you probably were like hey guys i'm still here just yes but you know when you think of it that was to be a flashback and and uh you know i guess i could have still played it but uh, they had everybody who was in it was an actor who played there was an actress who played mrs rogers and a an actor who played of course uh fred tom hanks so it was all who, actors who, who i don't think they wanted a, to... who is a brilliant brilliant actor like yes. he's the kind of guy he, who can if it's a funny like one of my favorites is toy story and of course he's woody yeah. in that and like if it's a funny movie like that he can be funny if he needs to. Uh, yeah. If it's a serious movie, like Big sort of is serious. Uh, uh, it's got funny moments, but of course it has its serious moments too. He plays it serious really, really well. Yeah, he's an excellent actor. He's probably yeah. the the the, to- the top actor in in Hollywood today. He combines yeah. he combines Cary Grant and Gary Cooper and all the big stars of the forties and fifties into one person. hundred percent. That is a great way to describe it. And he's a, and he's a wonderful man, a very, very friendly. And he introduces himself and he'll, he, he remained in the, the group. He didn't go off. Well, he had a trailer that he would go off and change and relax, but he was very much, uh, interested in other people and I think right. he did no he didn't look identical to Mr. Rogers but he had the essence of Fred Rogers and it worked right. I think he got and he came to uh, Pittsburgh by three months before they started the film to do some research there's a and you can get this online there's a Fred Rogers Center at St. Vincent's College in, in Latrobe I don't know if I mentioned this or not, uh, but that's where all the archives are. And he went there to find. Oh wow! Them. No, I don't think you did mention that. Yeah, it's and, and people can visit it if they like. It's in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, on the campus of St. Vincent's College, and that's where they can uh, see. There's a little timeline display, but they if you're if you're working in researching children's television, it's a research center too. You can research there. He went and. Watch some programs. All of the programs are there on, or are there digi- They have them digitally or on DVD or both. Mm-hmm. You can watch any program if you're there. You can't take it out, but you can watch it there as reference. And he mm-hmm. did, and he came back prepared. He did his homework and knew about Fred. And he didn't know that much about Fred before he took the role. He knew of him, but he was not of the A. You know, he had grown up before the neighborhood was on the air. Or he was too old when it was on the air to watch it. But he did an excellent job, I thought. And that mm-hmm. whole film portray, portrayed, 
get, they added a few little things, like the fight that the at the. Did you see? You said you saw it. I wanted to, but oh, I, I, but I uh, ran out of time uh, to oh, see. Well, it. you should, you should see it. Well, you know, uh, you know yeah. what? I'm gonna put it on my things to do uh, tonight. I'm going out a little bit uh, later, but when I get home, that's the first thing I'm gonna do is watch yeah, that you, movie. You should watch it because it. I think you'll enjoy it, and mm-hmm. and just recommend it to your viewers too if they haven't seen it. It's called. Uh, I get to make if that's won't you be my neighbor? Mm-hmm. That's called won't you be my neighbor with Tom Hanks as. Yeah, Mr. Rogers. I, there's a documentary called "A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood." Is it? Do I have I, that right? I, I, actually, it's the other Maybe way around. Have... the The documentary is called "Won't You Be My Neighbor." The film with Tom Hanks is called "A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood." Neighborhood. That's right. I should know that. It's it's easy. It's pretty that. easy to mix up though because they came oh, out yeah. around the same time. Around the same time, and at the same time, PBS also did their own version that play on PBS and it was narrated and hosted by Michael Keaton. Michael cool. Keaton. I love and Michael. Michael. Michael worked on the program for a while. He's from Pittsburgh. I didn't know that. Whoa. Yes. He ran the trolley. He worked on the program for four years. Yes. That's cool. And, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Beetlejuice ran the trolley. <laughs> Beetlejuice, Batman, Jack Frost, and Chick Hicks from Cars and also the Vulture from Spider-Man. Yes. <laughs> yes, he uh, Michael is from uh, Pittsburgh, uh, uh, not far from. He lived in one of the suburbs, but he came to uh, QED to work on the floor crew. Uh, that is so cool. And he was assigned to work on our show, ran the trolley, and did other jobs on on the on the floor crew. And he, he I did became, not know that. You did. Oh, I thought you knew that. You did. No, no I, I, I never knew that until just now. Well, there's wow. part of your trivia nostalgia. That's yeah. perfect for the show. And uh, then he went on to Hollywood, and he's, I think, his first feature film was uh, with Henry Winkler in uh, was Night Shift. I think it was called. That was his first film, I believe. I think he was on a, a sitcom before that, but mm-hmm. uh, that was his breakthrough. That film, and he's mm-hmm. been. He's been he's a wonderful actor. He, and he too can do comedy and drama mm-hmm. equally as well. Yeah. And, I, I I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Jack Frost with him in it. I've seen parts of it. I haven't seen the yes. Okay, yeah. I I did a retrospective on it. Uh, I do these videos sometimes called Nostalgia Talk Bonus. And uh-huh. uh I do those in many, many ways. Uh, but every Christmas I take obscure Christmas movies, TV episodes, specials. And I rewatch them and talk about them. And Jack Frost was one uh, that I did a couple of years ago. And it's uh, one of my friends watched it and she texted me. She's like, you never told me that it was a sad movie. And it is. Uh, and that's a good example of Michael Keaton being yeah. serious when he needs to be serious because his character dies and then is reincarnated as a snowman. And oh. there are some funny moments with him as the snowman. And in between, well, that's between the serious stuff. Uh, well, he can handle that as well as he can the 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 like night shift. He was he mm-hmm. was very he was sort of a cocky, uh, funny man, you know, with with quips and jokes and so forth. And he can do all of that. And then and then and then he can do Batman. You mm-hmm. know, the the he did two Batmans, I believe, or was it three? He did. Two I, I, he, three. he he just did one recently, actually. He, but he wasn't Batman. He was in. He was in it, but he wasn't Batman, was he? He was. was uh, yeah, he was the Batman character, Bruce Wayne. Okay, but th- the first time he did it was back in the nineties. The first Batman. That's right. Yeah. Right? Yes, that was the classic one. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I I saw that. One. In fact, I remember taking my my kids to see it. Mm-hmm. But um, Michael's. Uh, it, it, speaking of Tom Hanks and Michael, they're they can they do they're. They're equally talented in both comedy and drama. Yeah. Uh, and the two of them got to uh, do that in Toy Story 3. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yes. Boy, I, no, I forgot about that. I'm glad you're you're up on your nostalgia. <laughs> well, I, I, Toy Story is one of my very favorite films from my childhood. Uh, they just recently announced Toy Story 5 and the kid in me. I was born when Toy Story 2 came out, but I never saw it in the theater at the time. Um, the kid in me is like, like there's a photo of, um, Adam Sandler in a daycare and, uh, uh-huh. 
uh, from Billy Madison. And it's like me at Toy Story 5. That is me, the grown man in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. the, so that is that, would you say that was one of your favorite films? Yeah, from childhood? Absolutely. Do you have any now that you can think of that's a favorite one you've seen recently or within the past couple of years? Uh, probably the Elvis one, speaking of Tom Hanks. Oh, you, oh okay. The, that you was... Like Elvis. That was very, very well done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. The man who played Elvis. Uh, Austin Butler. Yeah. Is very good. He he doesn't when he's on talk shows, he doesn't he doesn't look like Elvis, but he really carried it off. Yeah. He, yeah. He did a phenomenal job. Like, yes, is Elvis is a hard thing to uh, to imitate. Yeah. And sometimes but he, he nailed it. He did. Just nail nailed it. it and, yeah. And it's a it's a role that you could, it, it could be end up being a caricature, and he didn't he made it real. It wasn't a caricature, and that's somebody like Elvis. He's been parodied so much over the years. Yeah, but you Austin know. Butler just did it hundred yeah, percent. And, and, and on. that's yeah. a delicate line, not to cross over into parody, but to get capture the essence of that person, which he did. Yeah, and, incredibly well. Yeah. And he, and he and off screen he doesn't look anything like Elvis. I don't think. Well, he, mm-hmm. like he may be a little, but you wouldn't look at him and say, "Oh, he reminds me of Elvis Presley." But whoever <laughs> cast him had a good eye and knew he could carry it off. And I uh, I, I enjoyed that. He was excellent. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that, so that's talking of that. He now he's another actor who's going to be around for a long while uh, yeah. austin butler i think yeah he's um, gonna he's gonna really he's gonna really he's, uh catch on i think he's really caught on with that oh i think that was a, that was a, a star making role as they say as as it was with michael with uh with the, the, the i was, I was about to say with the guy controlling the trolley but yeah with batman too but you know yes this is the trolley guy yeah the, that trolley guy yes but <laughs> yeah. anyhow i didn't i thought you may have known that but no uh yeah, he he worked on the program for about four years, and uh, let's see. The last time I saw him was they oh they had a surprise, the governor of Pennsylvania at the time. This is going back about oh maybe ten years, eight years. Uh, they the governor has an event every year to celebrate people, famous people from Pennsylvania. And they have it every year at a different spot around Pennsylvania. And they had it at a city near Harrisburg. And they were honoring Michael and a couple other people. And somebody called me from the governor's office and said, do you think that you could come and surprise Michael Keaton and bring out? And I did. He, <laughs> I think I came out and I think I delivered the, his medal or whatever they gave him that day. He was surprised. Well, talk uh, talk about a it. speedy delivery. That was a speedy delivery. And they were honoring. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Uh, uh, and they, I think there were about five people. They were honoring an author and a performer and a musician, all from Pennsylvania. And they do it every year. And that year, Michael was Michael's being honored, and they had me deliver the uh, the award. And that's I think that was around the last time I uh, I uh, I, was, I saw him. But he, mm. he's a and he's a funny man. He's got a natural sense of humor mm-hmm. and a very, very kind man. He's very close to his family. Mm-hmm. And he's he was always making trips back to Pittsburgh to visit his family. Very, 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 uh, very down to earth person. No errors. Mm-hmm. So uh, and that's the way he was when he worked on the, the neighborhood, too. Mm-hmm. And I think he really loved doing the trolley. <laughs> operating the trolley mm-hmm. so now you have a little bit of trivia there that's right well that's all i've got here on the uh q a uh is there anything you want to say to uh to close out well let's see uh yeah so people want to just remind people that if uh they want to catch up or have never seen mr rogers neighborhood that's available at pbskids.org mm-hmm. and you have to download that app now i don't know how you find that app you might know how to do that but there is an app, pbskids.org, and you mm-hmm. download it, go into it, and then you can watch a lot. And I think there's about 300 Mr. Rogers neighborhoods that are available. 
Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you said it was on YouTube, too. So I want to remind people if they've never it's on, seen it's on it. YouTube, it's on the app. It's on uh, it's still airing on PBS, which yeah. is a wonderful thing. Yes. And uh, and to have people encourage PBS to keep it going, they, they just let PBS know that they still want to see have it available. However, they make it available. So now it's available through that 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 app. So I hope they keep that and keep the neighborhood going. And the other thing is to uh, remind people of the of Dennis Scott's music. Uh, how, That's right. How to yes. Get that. Yes. And I think you'd appreciate that because that is uh, a, a group of wonderful songs done by different artists. And uh, and as you and we talk about Tom Hanks, his wife Rita Wilson sings one of the one of the uh, songs. Yes. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, that's what I want to remind people of. So uh, you can do that. You can put the link somewhere that people can click on it. And you have my email if anybody wants to tell me about how they liked or how they grew up with Mr. Rogers. Be glad to hear from them. Mm. So that's that's how I can uh, wind up my part of this. Now, you, you've you got to wind up your part of it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, let, let me uh, wind up my part of it, like okay. winding up the trolley by, first of all, <laughs> by thanking you, David, for joining me for Nostalgia Talk today. Well, you're welcome. Oh, well, I have another idea how we can wind it. Both of us can wind this up together. Here's what we do. I'm going to count to three, and we're both going to say speedy delivery. All right. <laughs> okay, uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, but before uh, we do that, uh, to all you listeners out there, you guys know where to go uh, for news about Nostalgia Talk, Facebook, Twitter. Those links will be in the description. And also, of course, I would like to once again thank mine and David's mutual friend, Dennis Scott, for connecting us. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, count down now. I'll do it with okay, you. Okay, here's the countdown. Get ready. Yep, and I'm ready. Can, and viewers can do this, too. That's One. Right. Two, three, speedy, speedy delivery. Delivery. Bye bye. Peace out. Thank you, James. Bye bye.